there. Anyway, so uh, my proposal is that since we, we planned a short break uh, after the next two sec uh, sessions, we, we're going to have it a little longer and have some coffee there. Okay, so again, apologize for this. And there's another variation uh, on the uh, program. Uh, apparently, all weather forecasts agree that it's, it, it will be raining heavily after 8 o'clock. So we have to change, we, we have to move our uh, welcome cocktail from the uh, inner court, which is quite nice, to a very, very, very nice place, which is just the uh, a room opposite, which... Are, are we recording? Stai registrando? Mario, stai registrando? Okay, I can't say this then. Uh, but anyway, we, we, we're going to be there, and it's going to be very, very nice. So 8 o'clock, we, we, we're going to be uh, there instead of the um, uh, inner court. And I think now it's time for me to uh, give a very, very well, warm welcome to Giacomo, Giacomo Bormetti, who's going to speak about yield curve strategic prediction. Thanks very much, Giacomo. Okay, it's working. Okay, um, so thank you, Eichel, again, this year. Uh, it was my pleasure last year to uh, participate to this conference, and last year I was talking about stochastic discount factor, and we, had, we were extremely lucky because after that we were able to uh, finish our paper, and so I hope this will be a kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> something good for this work, which is a joint work we are, I'm doing collaboration with Chiara Sabelli, which is a postdoc uh, student here in Pisa. Uh, this is a project which is basically funded by Unicredit. It's something that we are developing together with the risk office in, Un in Milano. And the idea is the following one. Uh, we would like to understand how to project the hill curve into the far future. And so, uh, what is the hill curve? I'm going to give you a, um, a quick idea of what is it. I, I think it's a common knowledge, but just to be sure that everyone knows what is the object I'm talking about. Hill curve is providing a picture of the emerging economy. So, there are actors on the markets or in the academy, which are academic economists, traders, risk officers, investment committees, which are looking at the hill curve, and they act on the basis of the hill curve. And as you can see, academic economists uh, uh, use it planning reports and public policy, but uh, I'm much more interested in the role played by risk officers and investment committees. Uh, notice that uh, these three groups here are formed by people who are looking at the hill curve, and they, then they decide how to act on the market, and so direction is also affecting the hill curve. So there is this feedback effect between at least the long hand of the hill curve. So we explicitly took the viewpoint of the last two categories. And uh, uh, what do I mean with strategic investment, strategic predictions? I mean in contrast with tactical investment decisions. So our idea is to develop a model which is, able to, which is not able to outperform a benchmark strategy in the short run. And uh, it has to be a, a, a model which is able to support strategic asset allocation, which means allocations on the very uh, long future. And uh, the last one is the main reason of the collaboration with Unicredit is that we are interested in what is nowadays required by regulators, which is ability co to compute expected exposures. So if you enter a contract, a very long, uh, a contract which is expiring in a very long future, like an interest rate swap, which is expiring in 50 years, regulators are asking you to provide an evidence of the expected exposure that you expect today within 25 years, 30 years which is basically something with obviously nonsense, but it's required by regulators. Okay, so uh, if, if one of you is really able to predict what is going to be in 50 years, please tell me and <laughs> we will make money out of that. So what is the outline of this uh, paper? We'll show you some empirical evidences of the Hilt curve and uh, how we, uh, at the end, was 
uh, able to describe the heat curve as a whole by means of heat gyro Morton approach. But we, were, uh, we wanted to capture the volatility content of the, of the curves. And uh, uh, after a preliminary analysis, uh, you can really convince yourself that you can really decrease the dimensionality of the problem by means of principal component analysis. And you can end up with a very simple model, uh, which is based on three factors. Uh, and then you can embed the dynamics driven by macroeconomic variables into these three factors. This is basically the story which you can find in the literature. And then at that point started our work, which is still in progress, because uh, as you, many of you probably know, starting from 2007, there exists no more just one single curve. There exists at least five curves per currency. And so it would be interesting to try to understand if we can export some of these results into this uh, multiple hill curves framework. And the last point, which is in a sense linked to what I presented last year, is is there a way to link this kind of modeling with discrete time affine process? The answer is yes. I'm not going to spend a lot of uh, words on that. It will be probably work, work on progress. So what is the hill curve? Uh, I plot here. Uh, basically 60 hills curve. You have here 10 to maturity buckets on a hilly basis. This means that you are looking at 50 years in the future from now. You are looking here at 25 years in the future from now. And you have here the hilled. So for example, these 22 curves here are those that, you, that we recorded in December 2013. They are very close to one, one to each other, so you cannot really see much volatility in these curves. And there is this typical shape. In the long run part of the curve, there is a flat structure, which is around 2.5%. Uh, uh, and then there is this positive slope in the short run. But uh, if you look at those curves here, that curve, those curves over there, are those that we recorded in September 2008 during Lehman Brothers' uh, trouble period. And so you see here that some, some astonishing facts. You see here that on, this, on a daily basis, there was a variation of the level of the rates of order, you see 5%, 4%, 25% on a monthly basis. And what, what is more, dramatic in a sense, is that the very short yield that you are required to pay if you want to enter the liquidity market which was higher in one day, one, one week, one month, than in 50 years. So there was a signal that the market was really scared about what was happening. There is not real common uh, agreement on how to, if an inverted curve is really signaling something which is going wrong in the market, but is something which is scaring usually. And there is also this typical curve, I don't remember when I recorded it, which is flattish. Flattish means it's very steep here, you cannot even see, and then it's basically flat. Okay. So a good model to forecast uh, hilt curves should be able to capture at least this zoology of curves, inverted curves, when the initial point is higher than the final points, Normal curves, like those one we, are, we experienced at the end of 2013, or steep curves. And which are some of the typical uh, properties of hilt uh, uh, curves? You see here curves for the euro, for the Swiss franc, Great Britain pound, and USD. And this is for, these are rates uh, since January 1996 to July 2013. And this is the one-day maturity. This is the overnight rate. And so you see that this is far from any uh, stochastic process in continuous time that you've probably ever seen in your life. Because here there, is, there are lots of steps, and there are a lot of spikes. And these are effects which are mainly driven by the central banks. And these are liquidity squeeze. And uh, so there is this very uh, strange behavior in the short run. And, but if you look at the long end of the cards, I'm considering here three years maturity, 
These curves are mimicking the shorthand, but they are basically affected by the investor's decisions, and they basically are also tied with uh, uh, macroeconomic indicators like GDP or inflation. And this is uh, indeed the uh, yield curve for the euro zone. This is uh, just one of the possible curves. This is a three months tenor. And you can compare here the level of one day maturity. Uh, the green one is the six month, the yellow one is the two years, and the red one is 10 years. So you see this typical phenomena. The European Central Bank is increasing the, the rates, uh, but the long run is almost keeping uh, constant, and so the curve is flattening. And the uh, seven months late, the European Central Bank was cutting the refinancing rate by a huge amount of 325 uh, points, basis points. So the idea is that if you want to describe this kind of uh, behavior, you really need a model which is um, essentially multidimensional. You cannot really focus on the short run, on the long run. You really have to capture the behavior of the curve. And one of the most successful approaches is based on the Higgero Morton, which is a standard model for um, hill curves. In Sparsimonius, it's well-established modeling approach. And uh, we were interested in this model because it's extremely feasible to capture the volatility structure from historical uh, perspective. Because what we are modeling is small f, which is a technical quantity, it's a instantaneous forward rate. I'm not going to define it in a more precise way. But what is important it is that it is defined by a stochastic differential equation. And you have here a vector of Brownian motions, K, capital K Brownian motion. So if K is of order 30, as it is usual in this model, then you have 30 Brownian motions, which are uh, leading the curve. And there is this volatility structure in front of them, which depends on T today and on the maturity, capital T. And this model is completely fixed by uh, the volatility structure by means of some uh, arbitrage arguments. If you want to live in a, in a real world, you have to have the market price of risk, which is proportional, this quantity here in the drift, which is proportional to the volatility. So the point is that if you uh, use this model to describe the evolution of your curve, what you really need to understand is the structure of this sigma. Uh, we were working on X, which is the time to maturity, which is the difference between capital T and today, minus T. And so there is this structure. Uh, we assume the vol this uh, matrix to be uh, depending only on the time to maturity, and we assume it to be a symmetric matrix, K by K symmetric matrix. Why? Because if you have this kind of structure, you can apply principal component analysis. This is something which has been done in the literature because you really want to decrease the number of factors that you need to describe your curve. And uh, you don't want to work with 30 parameter, 30 Brownian motion, but you want to work with F, capital F, Brownian motion. Three, four, six. It is completely data-driven, so you are not fixing a priori. And the idea of the principal component analysis, it's, it's quite uh, standard. The idea is that if in two dimensions you have these uh, clouds of points uh, and you have the standard reference X and Y, and with respect to this reference, the variance-covariance structure of your data is, uh, is uh, it's normalized, so I have one and one volatility for X and Y, and there is 0 0.9 correlation. And the, the principal component analysis is nothing more than a rotation. So there is a small mistake here because an orthogonal transform is a trace preserving, so the sum of the, the diagonal should be equal to two. Uh, but the point is that when you move in this new reference setting, uh, out of the diagonal there is zero. And what you really need to uh, know is the structure of the eigenvalues. But what is usually happening is that the first eigenvalue is extremely large compared to the second one. So in order to describe this data class, you, can, you could drop the second component and just consider the first one. That's the main idea. And if you do that, and we did that with data from 2004, 2014, uh, you can consider uh, different sampling 
basis, daily, weekly, and monthly, or you can consider different windows when you want to estimate this quantity. One here, three here, four here, five years. And you see here the, the fraction of uh, variance explained by uh, the first five components. And so, for example, here this is 95% uh, variance preserved. And so you see that during the credit crisis in 2007, 2008, in the 2007, the number of factors required to describe 95% of the volatility increased. With only five, you are able to reach 85%. But we were focusing on this uh, region here, where you have three years sampling period and weekly data. And indeed, this is the, the result. The result is telling us that before uh, 2004, and these are standard results that you can find on the papers by um, uh, Dibon Lee or uh, uh, Nelson Siegel, you can find that uh, with just three factors, you were able to uh, explain the volatility contents of your uh, yield curve. During the credit crisis, this, there was this jump to seven, eight factors, and today it should be sufficient to work with five factors. So the idea is that you can describe the whole curve with just five factors. So up to now, I'm focus I've been focusing on the structure of the eigenvalues. Let's have a look at the eigenvectors, which is much more interesting. Because if you look at the first three eigenvectors, you see something which is extremely interesting. Look at the first one, which is the blue one. It's basically uh, negative definite which means that it's giving weights to all the components with a coherent sign. Look at the second one, which is the red one. Uh, just forget about this jump here, which is due to, to liquidity squeeze, and so it's a spurious effect. There is a very short component which is negative and a long component which is positive. So this is basically mimicking a, a finite approximation of a first order derivative. If you look at the third one, the third component, there is a positive weight in the medium term, there is a negative weight in the very short term and in the long run. So this is mimicking the uh, behavior of the second uh, differentials. Indeed, if you uh, make this kind of exercise, you, you plot the level. The level is uh, the, the level of the 10 years yield, or the slope. Uh, proxied by the difference between 10 years yield and three months yield, or the curvature of the curve, which is a second order differential constructed from uh, two years yield, 10 years yield, and three months yield, and you plot them, which is the, bond, the, the bold curve, uh, and you also plot the principal components, the scalar product of the principal components with respect to the, uh, with the, rate, with the buckets of the curve, you see that they are extremely correlated, and the level of correlation uh, goes up to level uh, 99%. So the idea is that you can really work with a model which is based on just three factors. And those three factors are the level, the slope, and the curvature. And so what you are modeling is no more something which is related to the Jaron Morton framework, but with a very simple structure, which is telling you that the yield with respect to today and with respect to time to maturity x is a superposition of three factors, level, curvature, and uh, curvature and slope, sorry, which are uh, loaded with suitable loadings, which are mimicking exactly the structure of the eigenvectors. So you have equal weights for the level, uh, weights for the short end for the, uh, the slope and uh, um, weights on the medium term for the uh, curvature. But you don't want to have just a fitter, you want to have also the dynamics. And so the idea is that those two guys here, which are the level and the curvature, are driven by a very simple autoregressive process, which is R1 dynamics. But you want to plug some information from the macroeconomic dynamics into the, uh, the slope. So this is sensitive to macroeconomic factors. The idea is that uh, uh, the central bank is acting on the market, uh, so uh, if the GDP's growth is low, 
the central bank is stimulating the economy, just lowering short-term interest rates. If you lower the short part of the curve, then the curve becomes steepest. And uh, if normal economic period, there is no action from the European Central Bank, so we are going to call this a normal curve. If we are experience of period, a period of high inflation, then the central bank is increasing the policy rate, the short part of the curve, and so the curve is flattening. And so it's becoming flattened or inverse. So the idea is that we need to embed a, a Markovian dynamics, which is able to switch from these three uh, different states, uh, inverse, a steep and normal curve, and the, the probability of jumping from one state to another one is driven by macroeconomic variables. Uh, you can find all the details of this kind of approach in this paper, which is a working paper of the European Central Bank, but the idea is that you go on the market, you look at the GDP and CPI, this is the delta gross domestic product, and this is the delta uh, consumer price index on a yearly basis, and you see here, for example, that in these three periods, 71, April 74, and April 80, there were peaks in the delta CPI. And so what you expect is that your Markov model should be able to identify that in these three periods, this one, this one, and this one, there was a flat or inverse curve. So this is completely data-driven. And you can estimate all the parameters on this kind of data. And when you, once you have this, you are basically inducing different dynamics on the components of the curve. And so then you see here that this is the realized uh, history of the level, slope, and curvature. And in particular, if you look at the slope, you really see that it's really related with the level of the, the, of the, of the uh, variation in the inflation. So uh, you can use this kind of uh, uh, model to uh, draw scenarios if you want to make uh, uh, scenario-based uh, policy making, and so you can uh, devise future economic scenarios, um, positive or pessimistic scenarios. Here you see a drop in the GDP, negative GDP, and the high level of CPI. And what you see is that conditionally on this uh, structure of the future evolution of CPI and this in GDP, you can draw scenarios of this is the 10-year yield and uh, for the positive scenarios. And for the negative one, there is this drop in the GDP, and you see here that there is a switching point in the structure of the, of the 10 years uh, yield. Uh, OK, I'm, go I'm going to skip this, which is a testing environment for this kind of uh, models. Uh, and let's go directly to the multiple hill curve issue, which is something which uh, has become extremely important since 2007 and 8, because uh, if you try to reprice derivative contracts with just a single curve, you, you are going to fail. Why? Because basically, and that should be clear from this feature here, before 2007, there was basically no difference between these counting curves based on uh, Eonia. Eonia is uh, the is, is an index which is collecting the rates uh, that you are going to be charged uh, if you want to get liquidity from one day to the next day. On an overnight basis, you are going to uh, ask for liquidity, you are going to pay, the, uh, to pay a rate, and this rate is fixed basically by the European uh, Central Bank on the euro curve. And so this is not exactly a risk-free rate uh, because there is always probability of defaulting in one night, as uh, Lehman Brothers uh, was showing us. But the idea is that now, if you're entering a contract, you're asking for liquidity on a three months basis, which means I'm going to enter a contract with you, and you are providing liquidity to me, and I'm going to uh, giving you back in three months. The probability of default is much higher, and so there should be a, a spread, a difference between the rate I'm going to pay in one case on an overnight basis or in a three months basis. And the same for the six and for the one here uh, curves. So there is a clear hierarchy between the curves. Uh, the one with one here tenor should be the highest spread that you have to pay, while the six and three months should be slightly less than the overnight basis. 
But once you are uh, um, exchanging this kind of uh, derivative contracts on the interest fixed, fixed income um, market, the point is that you are always exchanging something which depends on the overnights, which is the numerator of your problem, and on the time structure of your product. For example, if you are exchanging a, an interest rate swap. So the point is that can we reformulate this approach, the approach I was showing before to deal with the multiple curves? Well, first of all, you need a model for uh, multiple yield curves, uh, uh, which is uh, similar to the HAM model, the H.R. Morton model, but in this new environment. And you can find this, uh, for example, looking at this uh, paper by Moreni and Palavicini on quantitative finance. Once you have found that, uh, what we did with Chiara was to study the properties of this basis. This is the difference between two quantities, which are very well defined. The first one is a quantity which is exchanged on the market. It's a forward rate agreement with tenor delta. It's a particular contract. Minus capital F, which is a forward rate, discrete forward rate, which is based on the Aonia. So this is sensitive to the risk-free part of the curve. This is sensitive to the delta tenor, but what is uh, good for this quantity here is that you can easily prove that this basis is uh, normalized by a money market account which depends only on the Eonia. So this is basically a numerator with respect to the Eonia curve, a uh, Martingale with respect to the Eonia curve. And so you can write an extended model, uh, an extended approach to the, similar to the HJM model for the entire set of forward rates instantaneous for what rates for the uh, Eonia and for all the bases that you want to consider in your market, which are parameterized by the tenor delta. Uh, what is extremely important here is that this eta, which is the Brownian motion, which is driving all the curves, is common to all the components because this is the, uh, the noise signal which is driving the Eonia uh, curve. If you now apply to this structure, extended structure, the principal component analysis, you will see this kind of result. This kind of result is telling us that uh, uh, starting from 2007, uh, you needed uh, basically nine, 10 components to describe 95% of the volatility content of your extended curve, not just one curve, all the curves. And if you move closer to uh, today, the number of components dropped to six, uh, uh, which is just few, uh, if, you are, uh, if you think ab about this, the risk-free curve is made of 25 maturity buckets. Then we are adding uh, three more basis curves. Uh, the first one with 20, 21, and the last one with 17 buckets. So you are basically, we are basically saying that you are dealing with 100 potential risk factors, uh, but you need just uh, six, of, six of them to drive the entire structure. Why? That's quite puzzling, but the point is that uh, the bases are much less volatile than hills, because uh, I'm done in one minute, because uh, if you looked at the term structure of the volatility of the uh, variations of uh, hills for different maturity buckets, you will see that, for example, for the overnight component, the variance is growing on, in four weeks uh, from 10 basis points to 20 basis points, while on the same period, uh, the basis for uh, the first uh, uh, tenor, which is one here, is moving from two basis points to 10 basis points. So the volatility content of the basis is extremely low, and it's mainly driven by the structure of the usual curve, the Meonia curve. So when, when you increase this, the dimensionality of the problem and then you reduce by means of principal component analysis, you get back to something which is extremely familiar. So just to conclude, uh, this is a kind of what I was presenting you is a kind of a review of what you can find in the literature if you want to deal with this kind of problems and you, if you want to describe the volatility or if you want to describe the dynamics of the component of the curve. 
and uh, it is possible to find some very successful uh, models like the Nelson Siegel with regime shifting, which is what I was presenting about the European Central Bank. But uh, three factors uh, can be too much for news, and there are periods of time where uh, you need more factors, and then there is no natural extension to the multiple yield curve. So what we have done is that there is an empirical evidence based on this extended HJM model, which is suggesting that you can really decrease the dimensionality of your problem. And the second point, which is in a sense related to the, the, the paper I was presenting last year about the stochastic discount factor, there is, a, there is a strong relation between this kind of modeling, especially the nelson sigan with uh, discrete time affine processes. So there is probably a way to bridge this gap between uh, a dynamical model which is uh, based on affine processes and uh, the nelson siegel approach, uh, which is something which are uh, probably interesting to try to do. Thanks very much, Giacomo. Are there questions? or comments. Yeah. Is there an intuitive explanation for why in, during the crisis period you need more factors rather than less? I'm asking because if you look at portfolio dynamics, it's exactly the opposite. So during the crisis period you need less, okay, you can do principal component analysis in the portfolio. So during crisis period you need less factor to explain more variance in the dynamics of portfolio. Essentially, the, the market mode, you know, the first factor is moving everything. While here it seems to be the opposite. It's simply because, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I have um, Well, no, I don't have an, a precise answer to this. Well, maybe the point is that uh, in the very, in the very, when there was a description of the curves in terms of the very short um, uh, interest rate, which was the modeling at the beginning of the 90s, you can really see that the, the very short term was able to describe the entire evolution of the curve. Then it, there was an, an increase in the dimensionality just starting the, sh the long run. So the idea could be that during that period, every sector, there was a segmentation of the curve. Every sector was really sensitive to different time horizons in the investment, but, but that's just a qualitative view. I don't not really, let's precise say, because this time series does not, not, probably they are stationary on the long term, but they look locally non-stationary. Non, non Could it be that during crisis period they, I don't know, they deviate more from, uh, I don't know. Could be, but we didn't measure. But we have to move to the next talk, yes. but let's thank Giacomo again before.